cause you to do great things in technology. Um, I'm a scientist working um, in, um, let's see, if I go forward and back, it comes back on. Um, I'm a scientist working in um, evolutionary biology, uh, originally trained in an area called theoretical population genetics. I've been at the University of Washington for what is now basically 50 years. Uh, I retired last fall, but I'm still continuing to do research. Since my research is just me, me and a computer and the internet. Um, and I've known Ken for, as he pointed out, 40 years, which scares me to think about. But, um, so um, what I'm going to talk about is some of the areas of science I work in. Um, and if you say, well, what's the application? Where, where can where can a million dollars worth of business be done here? The answer is, I don't know. If I knew, I'd probably uh, try to um, exploit it myself. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, the way how genealogies work, um, and also the issue of um, how genes move through genealogies, which is something people don't usually think about. And often when people are um, interested in genealogies, um, they're, um, they do so because perhaps they, there's a possibility of them having, some, having a famous ancestor, for example. So I'm going to start out showing you my famous ancestor um, with this guy. Uh, this is poorly focused, but um, this is Char Charles the Great, Carl der Gross uh, Charlemagne, uh, emperor of the Franks uh, from uh, in the, around the year 800, he's born in 747, it makes it easy to remember. Um, and he was a great king of uh, Western Europe at a time when Britain was um, tiny squabbling kingdoms, not all of whose names we know. Uh, he had started conquering big areas of Western Europe in uh, France, Germany, and the uh, Low Countries. Uh, his, his, uh, as, as I'll mention, as I'll come back to later, his uh, capital was um, the uh, city called then, I think, A La Chapelle, but it's basically Aachen in Germany now. Um, we'll come back to that. The, the region that he conquered was known as? It was the Frankish kingdom. It was a king, the There's a word there for it, though, right? That describes Charlemagne's domain. I don't know it. <laughs> okay, anyway, you may say, okay, so how do you know you're descended from Charlemagne? Well, you can look at my, uh, at my genealogy here, it goes back roughly into the 1850s. You'll see some people are starting to uh, not have names by the time we get there. And it's going to take about another 44 generations before we get back to Charlemagne. So have I had a team of genealogists working their way through obscure birth records um, in Europe? Um, and the answer is no. Now, I, my, my genealogy hasn't been done. Well, then why am I saying this? Because people who do work through genealogies have found that if you have any ancestors who are from Western Europe at all, then you too are descended from Charlemagne. <laughs> that any, any link, you know, any uh, lineage that you follow in, in Western Europe sooner or later hits some minor nobility and in a flash it's back to a lineage going to Charlemagne. Hit a lot of of legitimate and non-legitimate children. Um, and so he turns out to be the father, of, you know, one of the ancestors of everybody in Western Europe. And since some of my uh, ancestors came from Western Europe, uh, that makes me a descendant of Charlemagne. So you can look at my fat neck and say, <laughs> well, yeah, he looks like Charlemagne. This is a, a coin of Charlemagne's realm. And uh, Charlemagne was physically described as having a fat neck, so maybe that's why. But the fact is, everybody else here who has any Western European ancestors is also descended from Charlemagne, so you're just as likely to look like him as I am. 
Uh, so, so that's a, a, a sort of false clue. Well, if you have a famous ancestor, um, let's say Count the, the infamous Count Otto, which is an imaginary figure that I made up, and Count Otto, you, you know, flourished hundreds of years ago and used to uh, get up in the morning and uh, try to cleave people's heads in twain with his sword. Okay, so you get up in the morning and you're feeling kind of evil, uh, and you feel like you might very well like to cleave some people's heads in twain. Does that mean that's because you got a package of genes from Count Otto, and they're just expressing themselves in you and making you want to do that, of uh, those evil things to people early in the morning? Okay, um, I'm going to argue not. And the way I'm going to argue not, the first part of this talk will be talking about genes and genealogies. I am then going to go on to a couple other things. So the way I'm going to do it is by considering your, your genotype. Oh, OK, I'm going to be, and, and important to this story will be the uh, genetic phenomenon known as recombination or crossing over. Uh, technically, the one is a little bit different from the other. But uh, crossing over is the um, uh, stitching together of a gamete that here is, here is an individual who might be the father of, of this person here. Uh, it, here we're looking at a particular pair of chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And this individual is producing uh, a sperm, let's say. Something is going to go into that sperm, a complete, one complete set of genes from, the, from that chromosome. But it doesn't come by copying the entire chromosome, maternal chromosome, or the entire paternally derived chromosome. It can also come by stitching together the, the front part of one with the back part of another. So you get a chromosome that has, uh, whose, whose ancestry came not from a single chromosome in the previous generation, but from um, different parts from different uh, members of that pair. Okay, uh, that's, that's genetic crossing over. Quite it occurs very frequently. We have about, in producing a gamete, we have about 33 recombinations occurring. Okay. So here is the diagram I'm going to work you through. And it is going to uh, talk about you and some ancestors of you. Here you are. Now you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. They're of different sizes and so on. What I've done is just take the first three. Uh, and I made these uh, lengths of these approximately proportional to the lengths of those three chromosomes. There, let me just say, keep in mind that there are 20 more pairs, just like that. It's just that I didn't have room in the diagram. And um, there you are. Here is, I'm putting females on the left and males on the right. Here, here is your mother. Here is your father. Here are the mother's parents. Here are the father's parents. And we go back one more generation. And then I run out of steam for making the diagram. Here you are with your, the DNA. And uh, it, it could have various, uh, the, the uh, four letters of DNA could have various sequences here. They might, for example, be entirely, uh, this chromosome, this one might be entirely identical, although that's, that's unlikely. Um, but there, we just colored in the female, the, the chromosome copy, the, the individual chromosomes the set of chromosomes you got from your mother as red and the set of chromosomes you got from your father as green. So what I did was to say, let us, re using realistic rates of recombination, of crossing over, let's figure out where these red ones came from. And again, they're not going to come from an entire whole set. Uh, they will rarely come from an entire whole set from what parent, but they'll include bits and pieces from the two sets that are in that parent. Okay, here we go. And I've done that on both sides. And by putting in at random using the correct, approximately correct rates and rules, I put in the recombinations. And so um, the first, this chromosome number one, your maternal copy, 
came from your mother, it had to, it's a maternal copy, um, but there were a couple of recombinations, so it came, this part came from her maternal copy, this part from her paternal copy, and this part, again, from the, mat the maternal copy. And simil similarly, there are three chunks here for this chromosome number two, and actually four chunks for chromosome number three. Just using the random numbers that I drew with the correct rates. Can you mentioned the number 33 earlier. That's in total across all of the, um, the all, 23 chromosomes. Yeah, all 23 pairs, so 46 chromosomes in all. There are on average 33 recombinations approximately. Okay. And here it goes on over here. The paternal copy came from the father. Oh, there's a recombination there and one there, and none in, in that chromosome. Okay. So there, those are typical outcomes. So you can see that all of these genes are present. They have to come from somewhere, so they're all present here. But they're not all in the same chromosomes together. So let's go back one more layer to your, your grandparents. Now you see something interesting. Um, this set of ones here came from the, grand, the father, sorry, the mother's mother. And notice those red things don't include one of every gene. Um, so you have these red blocks here, and recombination has split them up some. And so they're coming from the two copies in the right back grandparent. And this set here came from over there. Same sort of thing happening. Um, now over here, same, similar things are occurring. This, these chunks here, uh, this stuff here. Notice, for example, none. This, this individual who is your father's mother, uh, your grandmother uh, on the father's side, in this outcome did not have any genes, your father's mother did not have any genes that got into you. It's there. And likewise over here, well here they are, they're where those genes are, they're over in the father's father. Okay. And then we go back another layer. But that's that particular chromosome, other chromosomes. Each chromosome will be doing, you know, these things at random. This is a particular outcome. I drew random numbers. If I did it again and drew different random numbers, the blocks would be moving differently. But this is just to give you a typical idea. Please. That randomness is also affected by um, recessive and dominant genes during the combinations? We're, we're only asking here where the copies that you have came from. Right. We're not asking what the actual sequence is. We're just asking where it came from. Okay. And we're not asking, therefore, how it expresses itself, whether right. if you have two different alleles in an individual, is one is dominant over the other. It doesn't affect this. Okay. This is only just showing you the process of how the genes are handed on down from parent to offspring, and, and how if you track backwards up the pedigree, what that looks like. So here we go to the great-grandparents. There are eight of them, 16 sets of genes here, because each person has two. And you'll see now that the blocks are kind of getting sparser. Uh, there are some individuals, let's see if I can find one of This one, one of your great-grandparents, this is two little bits here and here that got into you. Yeah. So then the white bits are the genes that did not get transmitted. Yeah, there are nice okay. genes there. They're right. affecting those individuals, but they don't happen to get, they didn't happen to get into the gametes in the right way to end up in you. Okay. Some of them there did end up here in this individual, but then didn't make it to you. The ones only the ones that made it to you are colored red on the father's side. Now, same thing going on, colored green on other side. And you get up to here, where is it? Let's see. This one has just these little blocks, nothing on chrome. These two are two of your great-grandparents. They're your father's mother's parents. 
none of their third chromosome got into you. Yeah. Uh, no, it would appear to me that likely that many of these combinations would be fake. No, these are these are in spite of the lurid red and green that I'm showing, <laughs> <laughs> which implies that something horrible will happen. Um, that's really just to track how they get to you. We haven't even asked the question of what actual sequence of DNA is in the DNA and what it does. Yeah. So it's just a matter of I got some genes from this parent, I got some genes from that parent, and we, they may all be perfectly okay, and many of them may all be similar to each other. So there's nothing about this that makes anything lethal or favorable or anything. We're just tracking you how just they're... You can't necessarily go up to great grandma and say, I got one quarter of you. <laughs> well, on average, of course. Right. You know, <laughs> um, if you pick a gene in you, if you if half of the time it'll be one that comes from your father. Half of your father's genes come from your father's... Uh, sorry, your mother. Grant, this is your mother. Half of your mother's genes come from her mother, and half of those come from that. Um, and that's, that is reflected here by all the white areas, uh, that there are genes there that, that don't get to you, um, and aren't, therefore, ancestral to you. OK, well, you can keep going back. I mean, I ran out of steam after this point, having to draw too many random numbers, although now that I've done it, I really want to make a computer program that will plot this automatically. Uh, I, did, I did the drawing of the random numbers by computer, but then I had to go draw in these blocks of the right size, which drove me crazy for a couple of days. Okay, uh, let's do a little calculation here. Um, so you get this picture, there are these blocks of genes that you, chunks of genes that you have that come from a particular ancestor. As you go back up, they get smaller and smaller because recombination will be breaking them up into even smaller chunks that go to back up to different ancestors where we're looking back up as if time is running backwards. So I can, I can say, well, uh, suppose I have a newborn uh, baby. Oops. Here we go, we go back one and forward one. No. Well, did you just, um Time out? No? Uh, I tried to go back. There, go. there we go. Okay. There's some kind of a, a, a sleep mode or something. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. Not my computer. Um, okay. Here's a newborn baby, zero generations ago. It, has, it, is, it is its ancestor <laughs> at that remove. There are 46 blocks present. Why? Because there's 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each of those is a block of of genes. Now we go back a generation to somebody about 27 years earlier. That's a, approximate, I think it's gotten a little bigger lately, but it's approximately a generation time. It's often, when you start thinking about this, you think, oh, generation, well, um, if you live to be 80 years old or something like that, isn't it 80? No, it's not 80. It's, it's the time, it's how old your parents were when you were born. And in fact, my mother was 27 years old when I was born, uh, not that recently. Uh, OK, well, you go back a generation, there are now two parents. 33 recombinations occurred. I'll make it exactly 33. And it's on average 33. It varies. So those 46 blocks got broken up into 112. And if you take blocks per ancestor, it's going up from 46 for the one individual to 56 blocks that are in that baby that when you go back a generation are in the two, are spread among the two parents. Okay. If you go back to the grandparents, there are four of those. Here's the number of blocks. An average of 44.5 blocks per grandparent. Um, that's a little smaller. Go back again, this doubles each time. Eight generation, 1937, 30.5 blocks. Because now, why is that happening? This is going up 
exponentially, it's, it's doubling every generation. Um, in a moment, we'll come back to that and see that I've, I've idealized a little bit. <coughs> this is going up by factor of two each time. This is just getting 33 more recombinations added each generation. It's not doubling. And so the result is this is going up linearly, but the denominator is going up, is doubling and doubling and doubling. So the blocks per ancestor goes down to 44 to 30 to 19 to 11 to 7 to 4 to 2.2 to 1.25. You're at 1775. Okay, uh, the birth, uh, you know, the start of the American Revolution. Um, and there are 512 ancestors you have back then. It's, it's kind of hard to grasp how many ancestors you have. 512 ancestors, among which there are 640 blocks that are spread out among those ancestors that are going to end up in your genome. And that means, on average, there's one and a quarter blocks per, per ancestor. That's not much. Um, each, in a sense, your genome is now in, in, uh, split up sort of into 512ths. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, there they go as 645. And you keep going, this number just starts getting small, and it goes down below one. And if you go back 15 generations, you now have 32,768 ancestors. That's a lot. OK. And I'd, just let me finish the sentence. And you have a th but you only have 1,036 blocks that, your gene that are spread out among them that are going to be ancestral to your genome. And that means your blocks per ancestor is 0.03. I'll, I'll take your question back. I'll ask why. Okay. I was just looking at the, looking at the years, the 13. I was wondering if there's any statistical importance to the year numbers, like 1664 to jump like 51 years old to do a 27 year oh, wait, uh, generations. Wait, 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 wait. It'll come wait, back. Wait, wait, wait. I'm, uh, there we are. I think it was a misprint on the 14th generation. Um, here? Yeah, well. So we're going back in time. Yeah, yeah. So it just jumped from 16. 27 years per block. 27. Well, I was oh. thinking that was the black plague, right? <laughs> You're right. Uh, no, you know what happened? Uh, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Uh, when I was making the table, I was editing these numbers. And I remember one of these digits got erased, and so I filled it in thinking I knew what it was. That's a mistake when I filled it in. It would have to be, um, well, if it were 27, it should be 1640. Yeah. yeah. But then this is correct, it's 1613. Okay. So you haven't got back to Columbus yet. We're back, <laughs> back at, uh, we're back when Jamestown has just been colonized in Virginia. Uh, 32,768 uh, ancestors, 1,036 uh, blocks. But now look at this number. What it means is if you Pick an ancestor back then. And let's say 1613 is when Count, the infamous Count Otto lived. Okay. And the infamous Count Otto has only a 3% chance of having even one block of your genome. That famous ancestor 15 years ago, 15 generations ago, who you are so excited by. <laughs> or, or worry about. Um, you can you can feel comforted that the homicidal activities of Count Otto pro quite probably didn't get into you, because of these thirty-two thousand ancestors, um, only a thousand and thirty-six of them have even a single block that's going to get into you, and all the rest, they're your social ancestors, but they're not your genetic ancestors. Please. Is it uh, is it reasonable to ask what the smallest amount of recombination is possible? If, if you the, mean the smallest length of a block, or the smallest height of one of those? Uh, yeah. Well, and and when you look back at that, let's see if I go back. Uh, 
uh, some of them are very small. Yeah. Uh, some of these little, little thing there, uh, there's, there's another one here, you can hardly see it. Uh, they're, they're, um, they are a few, what was I using? I was using, they're a few million, it, it sounds silly, but this tiny thin one might be a million bases long in the genome, because there's a lot of bases. It is very long, but is, is yeah. there a point where your graph on the next slide gets into numbers too small for most recombinations, and so we can assume that we didn't get anything from an ancestor? Um, they, it's a matter of how close a recombination can be to a spot where possibly in another generation there is also a recombination. That can get as close as one base. It's, and, and they, in fact, it can hit the same spot, although it's unlikely. Uh, they, the, the recombinations aren't occurring necessarily in the same individual. They, they, are necessarily, they, they would then somewhat interfere with each other, but they're in different generations. So, yeah. In a single recombination, what's the smallest number of bases that are in the Well, a recombination bases. switches you from one chromosome to another. So it just depends on how much it's out beyond the end of that switch. It's, not it's like block. you're going it's down the street and you cross the street at a random time wow. and keep walking on the other sidewalk. And then somebody says, but how far could that be? Well, just could depends you, how long the street is. Could you cross the street two base pairs from the end? Yeah. yeah. You, well, in principle, I think when you get down to the very end of a chromosome, you're in the telomeres. And, uh, don't, don't press me on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so the, the upshot of this is <laughs> you have a lot. I see my figure here. Um, you have a lot of answers. Um, it seems to want to readjust every time you switch slides. I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, I'm going to wow. switch slides in a second. Um, and Probably from a great many, once you get back more than nine or ten generations, you start to become into a realm where the average ancestor is giving you, you know, there start to be reasonable numbers of ancestors that didn't give you anything. You didn't get any genes from them. You might have inherited the castle. <laughs> but no genes. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, let me uh, switch from that. And, and that sort of is a bit of an antidote to the idea that from Charlemagne, one of us could have inherited a big package of genes making them somehow behave like Charlemagne, leaving out the issue of environment entirely. Um, okay. Now I'm going to show you a different kind of diagram that um, get answers a somewhat different question. And that question is, um, if, there's more, if there are, there's more than one of us in the room here, how can we think not about just the ancestry of one of us, but the ancestry of, say, two of us, and how related we are? Um, uh, by these processes of random reproduction, recombination, et cetera. And this goes back to uh, some work that really gave this tremendous publicity. And I, I happen to know the people involved, and I got to see them do this. Um, in 1987, there was published a, a tremendously famous study uh, that started talking about what's come to be called mitochondrial Eve. There's a whole story about it. I'm, not, I'm mostly not going to give that to you, except to say it was done in the laboratory of Alan Wilson, uh, famous, um, one of the most famous figures in the empirical study of molecular evolution. And his student, Mark Stone King, students Mark Stone King and Becky Kahn, and the paper is Kahn, Kahn Stone King, and Wilson. Um, and what they did is take mitochondria. Now, you have your 23 pairs of chromosomes, but you also have in every cell uh, little organelles originally derived uh, billions of years ago from bacteria, but that are part of your, important parts of your cell. They have a very small genome in them of uh, some 16,000 bases long. 
but it has some genes that are important, etc. It happened they were easy to extract from human cells in the era before modern DNA technology. And what they set out to do was to sequence, well, they, they used a, a partial sequencing method called restriction sites. I won't get into that. Uh, the sequence mitochondria from a whole lot of people of different origins. And mitochondria don't have recombination. They're just inherited from your mother. So they knew they would come, the mitochondria would come from the mother's, 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 mother's line in each person. There had to be some genealogy of those. What would it look like? They, by the way, um, Becky Kahn did something very clever. Um, they had to go to people and get a chunk of tissue and in the crude technology of those days, they needed a good chunk, a good sized chunk. They needed a pound or so of tissue. Well, somebody came up to you and said, could I have a pound of flesh? A pound of you, okay. Your answer would not be printable, okay. So, um, however, they found a way. They went, Becky Kahn went to hospitals in the Bay Area. This was at University of California, Berkeley. She went to the mothers in those hospitals waiting to give birth, and she said, look, you're going to have this wonderful baby, but in addition, you're going to have the afterbirth, the placenta. We're doing a research study. Could I have the placenta? And the parents said, well, of course, who cares? You know, we're just throwing it away. Have it. So she got a hunk of tissue from those mothers, namely the placenta, after they gave birth. And they went and made a tree. They, they got um, Hundred and what was hundred forty, hundred thirty-four um, people of varying ethnicities, and they made it a, a genealogy which was tree-shaped. Now this tree here is kind of weird; it's very wide, so it's been bent around in a horseshoe. It actually starts here and grows outwards, it grows out here splits this way and then that way and this group splits and this stuff splits. And there were there were several interesting features. One was Europeans and Asians were all on one side of the tree. Africans, however, were scattered on one on this side and on that side. The interpretation, which I won't spend time on, is that everybody started out in Africa. This is the so-called out of Africa story. Um, which wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite the story people thought in 1987, but this put it on the map. Um, and this individual, the other thing about it is they could tell by how much difference there was in the DNA, how far back, how many changes there had been in the DNA, which is reflected by those branch links. They could tell that this individual had lived approximately 200,000 years ago. Now, there were two features here. One is they were all tied together in a tree-like genealogy because mitochondria have only single parent. The female the mitochondria of everybody comes from their mother and from her mother and from her mother. And going back, all those lineages ultimately converge here. The other question, thing was the geography. And the third thing was how recently this ancestor had been. The ancestor, um, a science writer, um, John Tierney from the uh, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, heard that Alan Wilson was giving an, a talk to his department about his recent research. This is before the paper was published. He came to that talk and wrote an article about it. Got huge publicity. He coined the name of this individual and called it mitochondrial Eve. The word Eve tapped into um, Genesis and the Bible. It tapped into people. It was a woman in Africa. It tapped into people's ideas of earth mother goddesses. <laughs> it, it rang just about every bell that you could ring. <laughs> and um, there was a huge interest in this. Um, I was, uh, yeah, here is John Tierney's story of night after the paper came out. Newsweek put it on the cover with 
um, imagined uh, ancestors here is mitochondrial Eve, whose hair is artfully arranged. And the fascinating thing, <laughs> the barcode is part of the, instead of a fig leaf, there's a barcode. <laughs> okay. uh, which is really interesting. Okay. So um, now my own personal connection to this is, is I, I got to see it happen every spring um, in that period of years. I used to drive, in, we, we get spring break here at UW. I drive my car down to the Bay Area to visit my brother, uh, to visit uh, some other relatives. Um, and I would always stop in Berkeley and I would always go to Alan Wilson's lab and say, what's new? So I was in Northern California when the San Francisco Chronicle story came out, Scientists Discover Eve. <laughs> um, and I saw that, and oh my god, what's that? I drove the ne uh, that day to, to Berkeley, and I called up the Wilson lab. And, uh, Mark Stoking answered the phone. I said, is Alan in? And he said, Alan's in hiding. <laughs> so a huge uproar. But, population geneticists like myself got to Alan Wilson and said, you know, you're, you are surprised that all these individuals came from uh, one ancestor. But don't be, because that had to happen. Um, and that not only is true for mitochondria, it's true for any little region of your genome. If I take if I go around and I pick a gene, I'll pick malate dehydrogenase. Uh, it's a particular gene, it, 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 it changes, I don't know, glucose into galactose or something like that. Um, and it's important for your cells. Everybody has two copies of it. If I take all your two copies and I sequence that region of the genome and if I can get enough variations that differ from each other, I could make a tree of all of our sequences. And that is because each of us, that gene comes from a gene copy in one of our parents, which came from a copy in one of its parents, and so on back. There's a lineage snaking back randomly up through your genealogy for the copy of that gene. In that first diagram I showed you with all the blocks, it's in one of those blocks going up. So essentially, uh, they collected more uh, or another sample of the yeah. placenta, and it wasn't on this chart. It would just push the ancestor chart back up one more level, well, one or two or three more levels. Except you right. can do the calculations show that that is very unlikely. And almost all the new ones you get would add little tips to this tree. I would have to give you a mathematical argument to, to show that. You can like wonder what I would say. Been cut off from the family tree at some if, point. If you had an, ice, yeah, an isolated right. island where they hadn't had any, they right. didn't know about the rest of humanity for 100, 200,000 years, yeah, right. that would be true. But we don't, we don't have those. Okay. Um, so let me show you this process. Of, and it gives us an idea how our different genes are related to each other. Um, we've already established that your genome is a patchwork of contributions from different ancestors. Um, now, here we're going to imagine a small population of individuals with two copies of each gene, let's say in the region uh, around the malate dehydrogenase gene. So we're looking at one little place in your genome. You have two copies, everybody has two copies. I'm gonna make a small population with only 10 individuals. And it's parent generation, I'm gonna have time going upward, so here's its generation. And you can go back and make imagine 11 generations of the, uh, of the diaphragm. But then you'd say, okay, but where do these copies come from? Well, it turns out that the standard scheme for theoretical population genetics, this field that I, that I work in, since known since the 1930s, um, is that each copy can be regarded, if this is just a random mating population, if these, these individuals 
as coming from one of the 20 copies in the previous generation at random. So there they are, drawing the lines in. So this is a random outcome. If we go back another generation, there we are. And I keep going. This is actually one of my favorite sets of diagrams of all time. Uh, I drew it very carefully. I generated random numbers on a computer. Um, and there it is. And you look at it, and then your first reaction has to be, what a mess. Um, I can't see anything. <laughs> you can see certain things very clearly. This is coming from that. But then others are going down through here. You can't see what's going on. Well, it turns out that if you forget about the individuals, sort of dissolve the big circle. And then you take the small, the individual copies of the genes and start swapping them left to right. You can untangle the diagrams. And it comes to look like that. You end up with no crossing lines. Whoops, I'm sorry. There. So if you swap left to right in the right way, you get the whole. This is, this is exactly that diagram unswapped. I was very careful. And you'll see that as you go back in time, it looks like rivers running together. Here's those, these tributaries leading into rivers. And when you go all the way back, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 generations, by the time you get back there, the tributaries have fed all their water into this gene and that gene. What does that mean? It means that the genes we have now are copies of previous genes, but some of those previous genes never had any offspring. And enough of them have dropped out that when you go all the way back 11 generations in this small population, uh, there's only two copies that are ancestral to all the copies that we have. Now notice I'm just asking to get where they came from, and not what the DNA sequence is. I'm not asked whether there are like mutations occurring or what the genes then look like and how they function. But it's just saying who's ancestral to who. So you get these, these uh, rivers, you're going back in time, rivers that are coalescing. And that's the word that's used for these coalescence. And it also means if you go into a population, you don't have to be get everybody, but you just pick a few individuals like this, like these three, they will form a genealogy which is a tree. Please. Those top three that you just highlighted, they all have the same gene? Uh, well, it depends on whether there were mutations along here, and I haven't, I haven't okay. uh, tried to find that out. So I, was, uh, I was about to ask if that Eve diagram because that, that's almost the reverse of what you just highlighted here. But I think it's the same. Yeah. The okay. Eve diagram shows the mitochondria going back in time, coalescing, and coming in the end from a single mitochondria in a single woman who we call mitochondrial Eve. And the three people at the top? Here. That, that's why I asked if they have the they same. They came name. from this individual. For, oh. that, for that sample, if a a geneticist came out and took those three copies. Right, sorry, I was looking at They it. would say, well, okay, the common ancestor is back 11 generations. Sorry, I was looking at time the wrong way. Yeah, yeah time, is, time is going up. So, so my, my question is, does that imply that the further you go back, if you ignore for those mutations that you, you pointed out uh, originate in the middle of this graph and other ones that originate without parents, if you eliminate those or, or leave those to the side, that implying that as you go further and further back in the history of DNA, you come to a single strand? You come to, um, in, in an ordinary population, in say human population taking a typical gene, you have to go back about 800,000 to a million years and you will come to the common ancestor of all the copies that all humans have. Of that particular place in the genome. But there's a catch, and the catch is if you move a little along the genome to the next gene down, genetic recombination is going to cause that to have a somewhat different tree. 
In fact, it's as if you have like something like 30,000 different trees for 30,000 different regions of your genome. Do trees hold up that many times? Um, did he, no, because a tree is multiple generations leading up to the present. As you go back, you're just adding to the tree. Um, the, the thing to say about this is, this is a genealogy for this, these three samples for this particular place in the genome. The next place down the genome is not very far, and it's a different tree. So, malate dehydrogenase comes from one copy, which is malate dehydrogenase, it's not mitochondrial Eve, it's malate dehydrogenase mal, okay, uh, which might be either a male or a female. Mitochondria have to come from females, but the rest of the genome comes from both males and females. So there's a hemoglobin helga. There's a cytochrome <laughs> SAM, okay. Um, there's a little piece of junk DNA gym, okay. Um, and your genome, our genomes here, if you imagine us as being in a population, each bit of our genomes goes back to some ancestor half a million to a million years ago in many cases. They were all in different generations and they were in different places. They didn't necessarily know each other. Um, and, uh, and that is how individuals in a population are related, just by the randomness of uh, the way genetic segregation and recombination and random mating of individuals in the population works. Let me just, uh, okay. So, so in addition to genealogies, there are these lineages that go up through those genealogies and coalesce with each other at random by accident. Uh, and it's all within the human species. And it's just the result of genes getting copied from parent to offspring. It's not, it's not a um, uh, some weird process, and it's all within normal human uh, reproduction. So, okay. The other thing I work on, I'll just I'll just do another couple of little vignettes, and then I'll stop and, and give give people time to ask more questions. Um, the thing, I, I work on this a bit with a colleague, Mary Cooner, who does a lot more work on it, and has, she's got some programs that can use, um, use the differences between the genes to estimate things about the population. For example, this is in a very small population, only 10 individuals. In, if you made a population 10 times bigger, 10 times more individuals, it will take 10 times longer for that tree to come back to a common ancestor. It depends on the population size. We can estimate those depths by looking at how different those sequences are as a result of mutations that occur on the, in the sequence. And that's what Mary's programs do. Um, and you then estimate, there's a, the, this came out of the mitochondrial Eve work, but has been verified by more work like this, um, back a while, before 50,000 years ago, the, when humans were, the ancestors of Homo sapiens were in Africa, I'll leave out the uh, Neanderthal admixture story for the moment. Um, they estimate that the population size of those individuals was very small. It was like uh, maybe 10 to 20,000 individuals. Rather small population in Africa is the ancestor of, of most of our genome. And that can be done by looking, using this theory and looking at how different the genes are. Okay. Now, the other thing that I work on, in addition to doing this kind of population genetics, um, 30 years ago or so, I switched most of my work into looking at different species and looking at evolutionary trees that connect those. And this is a, um, an empirical evolutionary tree done by some people. Uh, it has a bunch of mammals, including humans right here. 
They took though the DNA sequences from some region of the genome, I forget what, and they can find the best fitting evolutionary tree uh, for that region of the genome for the different sequences that you get uh, out of different mammals. Here we see the, the ancestor of, of modern mammals back here somewhere. Here, here are two marsupials. Um, and these are placental mammals. Uh, they're actually leaving out the uh, one more lineage, which is the platypus and the echidna, <laughs> um, about five species. Um, anyway, here are the placental mammals. Um, the lengths of these lines is not time, but it's amount of change. Um, you see some things that are, make sense. Here's the rhino, the tapir, and the horse. Uh, here's cats and here's dog-like things. It's a cataform. It's some kind of a dog. Um, there are a flying fox and a something or other fruit bat, which I can't read. Whoops, I'm sorry. There. Hedgehog and shrew are next to each other on the tree. But there's a few things that were sort of surprises. One of them is, here's the hippo together with cows, ruminants, and pigs, and I think that's a Llamas? What is it? A llama. A llama. A llama. Yeah, there's a llama. So those are, those, are, those are hoofed animals, that's fine. But what's happening up here? Whales and dolphins, and who are they connected to? The hippo, which, by the way, is aquatic and gives birth underwater. Um, so the closest relative among modern mammals to the hippo are the whales and dolphins. Yes? How different does this tree look as you sample different parts of the genome? Okay. It's actually pretty good. And the reason is, in this case, there's a resampling method where we resample within the sequence to get an idea. Uh, it's called the bootstrap. Um, I am the one who applied it to evolutionary trees back in 1985. Uh, these hundred, these numbers up here say out of resamplings from this genome, what percentage of them give that, that make, have that lineage there that leads to that group? The answer for many of them here is 100, 100%. So what that reflects is if I go and take another part of the genome, I will in fact get a very similar trait, not exactly the same. There is noise, and much of my career has been developed, devoted to saying how do we statistically analyze that noise. Is the noise things like mutations, or? Sorry? Uh, is the noise from mutations or random crossovers? Uh, it's from mutations, including where at the same place in the gene, the same mutation might happen on two lineages and spuriously make them look mm -hmm. similar. Ah. Okay. Okay. That and that is what we're trying to correct for here. So I just wanted to indicate that actually a lot of my career has been devoted to phylogenies, evolutionary trees. How you infer them? What's the best single guess? And how do you make that whole process statistical? Yeah. How close is this kind of tree to like the Linnaean taxonomies we had before anyone could do this? It's close, but not. Exactly the same. For example, the Linnaean taxonomy put the um, the uh, artiodactyls, the the order Artiodactyla, um, which includes the hippo, cows, pigs, llama, uh, llama and camels, and so on. Um, those are in order. Another order is the, the order Cetacea, in the, which is the whales and dolphins. Now what this shows is that the order Cetacea is actually genealogically inside the order, um, the order Artiodactyla. So there's, there's some great similarities. Rhinos, tapers, and horses are um, uh, parasodactyls. Uh, they're, in, they're in order. Uh, cats, 
and dogs and bears and raccoons and so on are carnivora, although watch out, from the middle of the carnivora comes another order of pinnipedia, seal, sea lions, walruses. You know, you've seen a seal um, out in Puget Sound swimming along and for a moment you see its head and for a moment you think, who, who, who's got their Labrador retriever in the water there? Because the thing, you know, these things bark, I mean, and their heads look, and that's not an accident, okay? They're, they are, in fact, related to the dog, dog and bear side of the carnivora, okay? Uh, so here's one of these evolutionary trees. This is a pretty good one. Um, there are a few surprises. Um, there are things like the elephant and the hyrax. The hyrax is a, a little um, kind of a woodchuck looking thing in Africa. Uh, it's related to the elephant. Uh, and here is Cyrenians, that's uh, uh, manatees and dugongs. And they're related to elephants and hyraxes. That was known. A lot of these things were guessed. In fact, based on, on morphological work, based on bones, based on people in the structure of the ear, people had suggested that whales and dolphins were closely related to hippos. But that was just one of a number of suggestions back then. Now the DNA comes along, and basically the DNA has nailed it. Uh, not only this tree, but lots of others. Put, put the whales and the, and the dolphins right there. Can you talk about in your work how you move from um, uh, phylogeny or how, how things are expressed to DNA? Because that happened, that revolution happened in your time period. Yeah, what happened is, People had been making evolutionary trees using numerically coded morphology, mostly bone structures, cracks, seams in skulls and where they met, you know, a lot of, you know, huge amount of work had gone on for a couple of hundred years on that. Um, and you can computerize that crudely. But in the mid-1960s, there started to be molecular sequences not at first DNA, it was protein sequences at first. Um, and then protein sequencing started in 1977, but it became cheap enough for most, most of us ill-funded population biologists, evolutionary biologists in the mid 80s. And then people started doing lots of um, DNA-based evolutionary trees, and I believe this is DNA. Um, but it could also be protein sequences. So was your early work with proteins or even before my, that? My work is with computers. <laughs> I was saying, well, suppose we have a, a molecular sequence out there and I would have the computer simulate the evolution of this thing. So I didn't have to go get any actual organisms. Yeah, no, but I what the data was that you worked with. Yeah. So you yeah. essentially made up data and said, this is how it would look. But it didn't just make it up. We <laughs> simulated the evolutionary right. processes on a known tree. And then you can do things like see how close do you come when you infer them on with a, with a computer, with a, an inference method computationally, how close does that come to the true tree? Being, being the, the deity of that little model universe, I can know all the truth. Whereas in <laughs> real life, you don't know the truth. You know? Um, so, yeah. It would seem like you could zone in on that algorithm pretty fast since you already know where you need to get. Zoom in on, I missed a word. Well, an algorithm for <coughs> getting really, really close to what actually happened. Because you, yeah, could, you, you could, could guess at first, see how close you are to the guess, and then move towards where you need to be. Yeah, what you have is you have some criteria which are how well does the data fit the tree. Right. That's, there are methods called likelihood, maximum likelihood, and Bayesian inference that are widely used now. Uh, I was involved in getting people to use maximum likelihood starting in, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, now those methods using a, an approximate model of the random changes, we can, we can do a statistical fit of the data to the tree and find the best fitting tree. So that's what we're doing. I, I should end a wind up. I should. I was going to talk a little bit about one more thing, but 
these coalescence I told you about occur within a species. When you have an evolutionary tree, this blue or purple thing here, each of those lines is actually a population and you can have coalescence within it. I won't go into this in detail, but I'll just say it is possible at random for there to be discrepancies between the trees of gene copies and the actual evolutionary tree. But we know something about the statistics of that. And we can, by looking at multiple parts of the genome, average that out. It turns out that if I take um, a gene from me, a gene from a chimpanzee, and a gene from a gorilla, okay, the evolutionary tree is very, very clear now. Me and the chimpanzee, actually, I'm afraid to say you and the chimpanzee, too. <laughs> are our closest relatives from among those three. But if I look at individual genes, 70% of the time, the tree I get will look like that. 15% of the time, I will be most closely related to the gorilla sequence. Another 15% of the time, the chip and gorilla will be most closely related to each other. So there are discrepancies between these copies of genes that you <coughs> get from copies of genes at a particular part of the genome, and the, F, the real underlying evolutionary tree, people often say, aha, it shows that the whole thing is wrong. But no, <laughs> you expect that from these coalescent processes. Um, I won't go into you know, the, 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 the ins and outs of that. It, it sometimes gives us ideas about what effective population sizes were in previous generations. Anyway, that'll be all I'm going to say. And I think I should uh, open it up to uh, allow us to put on the lights. And uh, people oh, come right. ask me if you please repeat the entire thing, <laughs> if you want. Yes? Your um, the evolutionary trees based on molecular, on molecular analysis, how well do they match with evolutionary trees based on cladistics? Well, this, this is a whole contentious area. Cladistics <laughs> is a particular approach using minimizing the number of changes that is upheld by a bunch of people who I get into fights with. <laughs> but we're all, we're all trying to estimate the evolutionary tree. Um, they use the slogan cladistics and say you have to do it their way. But it's basically, that's the name mostly for one of the approaches to the same task. And, and we'll come up with very similar trees. Okay. The, the yeah. cladistics tree looks similar to this. Yeah, if you, if you did, instead of maximum likelihood, you did what's called parsimony, which is minimizing the normal number of changes, you're, you're generally very similar. They're sort of different statistical ways of subduing the statistical laws, making somewhat different assumptions, but they, they often give similar answers. Yeah? What do you, what do you think of those uh, commercial programs like Funny Free and they, they, they um, are They are actually, um, they look at variance of um, uh, variations in different parts of your genome, and they look at a very large number of them. The, the scientists who are working at companies like 23andMe, uh, I've heard them give talks on how they do what they do, and they're, they're confident they know what they're doing. The catch is that everything they do has some noise, statistical noise to it, and you have to be aware of that. And secondly, they often, uh, it's been very popular recently for people to have their DNA done and have a company like 23andMe or Ancestry.com or Family Tree DNA or whatever tell you you are 60% um, Irish and 40% Italian or something like that. The catch is you might have more than two origins. Looking back at this huge number of ancestors, um, 
they don't all have to come from the same country. Okay? It could be that you came not from two countries, but from 12 countries. Okay? And they're not going to tell you that. They're only going to tell you the two, you know, the two leading candidates. So it can be very misleading, particularly for people, you know, if your two parents came from different parts of the world, and then they themselves may have had ancestors who came from a number of different countries, their picture that they give you can be, it can be very oversimplified. And I know, for example, they also have to put a label on things. They say, I'll get you in a second. Um, they have to say, give a name to a place. So for example, there, there's a whole bunch of Scottish people who are terribly outraged that they're being told that they're Irish, that their ancestors <laughs> are all Irish. The reason is very simple. The samples that they've taken don't show very much difference between Scots and Irish. And they had to come up with one thing, and they had to give it a name, and they chose Irish. <laughs> they could have labeled everybody as Scottish. And so either you get all the Irish, all the Scots outraged at being called Irish, or you get all the Irish outraged at being called Scots. Um, and there are also some very, the, the names they choose are relevant to people in the US, but not necessarily in other countries. And the funniest example of that I know, there's this wonderful ad for Ancestry.com. And I was in Mexico giving lectures at the National University of Mexico and I told people about this there and they fell over them. They fell all over themselves laughing because this very nice older woman comes out and she says in the ad, I always thought I was Latina, but then I had my DNA done by Ancestry.com and I discovered I'm not Latina at all. I'm from all over. And they show a diagram and it says, you know, 40% Native American and 50% European and some others. So here she is saying, you know, her family may well be from Mexico, okay? What they just told you is a description of the population of Mexico. <laughs> and everybody in Mexico knows that, right? And so these Mexican scientists at the Evolutionary Biology Department at the U National University of Mexico City are hearing me tell that this woman says, isn't it wonderful, I'm not Latina, I'm this other thing. And she then gives a description that just tells her that her original idea was actually fine. Uh -huh. And uh, she so you, you just have to. Latina means. Sorry? Yeah. Now she just has a better idea of what Latina means. <coughs> right. Well, in that ad, she, she <laughs> didn't seem to. Nobody, <laughs> nobody had connected the dots there. Right. But I think people looking at that would say, wait a second, those percentages of ancestry are designed for US citizens. They don't have a category that say, hey, you look like a typical person. Mexico, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> How do they take into account like historical migrations? Like we talk about, oh, uh, sixty percent of my family came from England, but English, uh, Anglo, uh, Anglo Saxons came from the Anglo Saxons and Jews. Mm -hmm. Well, the exactly. Tribes, they, yeah, they, they, like, yeah, the Angles and the Saxons come from Saxony. West, well, <laughs> Saxony and uh, the Angle is is it right at the corner between Denmark and Netherlands. Um, then the Jutes are on the west coast of Dan Denmark. But then you go back further, and that's the point you're making. And those people all came by migrations from somewhere else anyway. So what they're doing is just going a certain distance. They're going back to the present day populations in those areas and saying that's who you're related to. If they're not taking into account the fact that all those people are going to go back to Africa anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't, they're not telling us that. Just yeah. kept DNA but, but test. Did. You're from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> within that limitation, within that limitation, comparing people to present day populations, and within those problems of what label you put on things, uh, and within the problem of telling people there are only two kinds of ancestry when really there might be six kinds of ancestry. Um, they're, they are doing things confidently. They're not, they're not completely misleading you. They're not, I think their technical, um, you know, their technical DNA uh, sequencing is, is okay. Um, 
And so in that sense, you can trust them, but watch out because there's a, there are limitations to what, to the way they say things to you. Yeah. So Sorry. 23 and the anecdote, I have myself and my family attested. Uh, my immediate family, my parents, as well as for fun. And I always knew that my much paternal side came from Denmark. And of course, that showed up in uh, M23's name as well. And on my maternal side, when I was tested three years ago, I didn't know where they came from, but a whole bunch of my uh, DNA served England and Ireland. And so since then, I've gone back on my maternal side uh, 26 generations. And sure enough, you know, the majority of them came from England, and then keep going back, and um, back to Saxony before that. 23 and me reflects um, the you, you, have, you have genealogical records back to the Anglo-Saxons? Yes. <laughs> it's way pretty from. extraordinary to have that. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I've been working at it for over a decade. Yeah. And uh, in most But of remember, it, many of them didn't give you any genes. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was a king of my ancestry, the king of Saxony, you know, in 600 uh, AD. Doesn't mean much to me today. Um, and all I had to do is get back about 12 generations. Once I got back to there, it's like, oh, I just connected my family tree to somebody else's. You yeah. know, we've gone back and then yeah. you know, a whole bunch of other people had already done the work and went back to. Yeah. Although, keep in mind, yes, there is such a thing as non paternity. People aren't always the children of who <laughs> they oh, sure. the records say they're the children of. <laughs> and, and by the way, yeah. geneticists doing human genetic examples or testing or teaching a class and having people get, getting, say, DNA samples from people, watch out. <laughs> that, is, that is lawsuit territory, you know. Uh, you don't want to be, you do not want to be in a situation where you take somebody in the class and say, you. Good evening. You, if you have items to hand out or you need a library card, please come to the checkout desk. If you are using our computers and printers, please finish, save, and print your work by closing time. Print release stations turn off automatically at closing. The library will close in 20 minutes. Thank you for using the King County Library System. Okay. So I just want to say, you do not want to be in a situation of teaching a class and having to say to somebody, did you know that your father is a really your father? <laughs> <laughs> don't want to go there. You don't want to be in that situation. <laughs> and that, that means that the kind of genetic testing that we're likely to do with well, teaching a class, well, these days, human subject, getting human subject permission is so hard that you, you, you want to do it on people's cats and dogs instead, well, basically. In genealogical circles, the family historian usually knows most of those stories as well, anyways. <laughs> They're saying they notes that don't get published. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Other questions, yes. Um, I was reading a few years ago about a discovery that um, apparently the people who were resistant to the Black Plague are now, you know, their descendants are now resistant to AIDS. And this was this was done not by DNA but by genealogical tracing. I'm just wondering if you make a finding like that, can can it can they find the gene? If they can find particular genes, and if they can verify that that makes you uh, resistant to the Black Plague, then if you have those particular genes, and, and if they can find that that made you resistant to AIDS, but they'd have to know all that. They couldn't just make a trick genealogy and tell that. I have not heard that story, so I don't know that there is any genetic variant that makes you resistant to the one that also makes a protein called CCR5 on the surface of white blood cells prevents HIV from entering these cells. And anyway, yeah, more there are that. some <laughs> variants that keep the HIV virus out. They're not common. They're very rare. Uh, but I don't know anything about the connection to black plague. And I, I don't. You know, if you had European ancestry and you're alive today, didn't you by definition have ancestors yeah. that were resistant to the black plague? Well, they, they found people in historical records who uh, their whole family died, they were in the house, and right. they didn't get it. But they didn't and then, they the traced the, then they traced the, the genealogy from there, but they didn't do it with DNA. DNA. It was well, they must have done it with something. But the, the, um, 
Yeah, um, uh, if you were descended from people at the time of the 1349 Black Plague, probably you're descended from people who were never, who were out in the countryside and never got exposed. Because if you got, if you were exposed to it, then I think the chances of being dead would be very high. But I don't know. Mortality Very, very high, yeah. So I think it's not that you recovered from it. I think it's that you, you never got it. Can you address the thing about cousins? Um, I have friends who've done the DNA testing and then they get so excited that they found a fifth or sixth cousin and want to meet them. And how much are they likely to in fact have in common with them? Yeah, well, fifth or sixth cousin is quite a small percent of similarity in DNA. Mm -hmm. It's probably like 1%. Um, and you have an awful lot of fifth or sixth cousins. <laughs> That's As funny. you go out each layer of cousins, the number of cousins might roughly double. Um, I had my DNA done, family, family tree DNA, and then I've given a long list of people who are related to me, almost all of them, fifth and sixth cousins. None of them, one person contacted me and said, oh, I see we're related, and we checked out family names, and there was a match, and she said, oh yeah, there is a match, that's probably how we're related, uh, but I'm not interested in that part of my family, I'm interested <laughs> in that part. So she went away. And one guy, uh, a guy, a microbiologist at the University of California at Irvine, who I had previously had emails with about how to use my computer programs, emailed me and said, oh, I just saw my DNA results and we're fifth or sixth cousins. <laughs> you know, isn't it great? We then checked, we had no family names in common. Um, they went, he was obviously on my father's side, they back, go back to an area in the western, now in the western, called Galicia. Uh, he was from one, his ancestors were from one part of Galicia, mine were from another part of Galicia. No family names matched. So it ended up just being a joke between us. And in the end, all those relatives that I found, they were all fifth and sixth cousins. None of them gave a hoot about me, and I didn't give a hoot about them. So <laughs> typically, when you talk to them, you might find a match in, in one family name. I think fifth and sixth cousins is not too exciting. Um, first cousins, you know, people are using it to do things like find out um, people who were adopted and who could not get records of their adoption are now finding relatives that way. Um, and it's quite interesting. I think we'll, thank you. How yeah. about three cousins? Well, I don't know. My mom and her sister married my dad and his brother, so I Yeah, Our so that, that is like, like a, yeah, that's what's called a double first cousin. Mm -hmm. It is twice, as you might imagine, twice as related to you. Your, the chance of a DNA match between you and them is about twice what it would be for an ordinary cousin. So would it look like we were sisters rather than cousins DNA-wise? You'd look like you were, uh, trying to do it on the fly. Yeah. And, and it's done, you know. Now, tech forum, how do we make a billion dollar industry? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs>